Hi, everybody. We're back. This is Dave Vellante, and we're here with Fred Destin, VC extraordinaire from Atlas Venture. Uh, Fred, welcome back to theCUBE. Thank you very much. Good to see you again. It's a great event. You know, a lot of entrepreneurs here, and I really think it's fantastic what you guys are doing for the community. So this was started by uh, Jeff Fagnan at Atlas and Heman Tanager at, uh, Catalyst, at uh, General Catalyst. And the idea was that the technology industry in Boston doesn't give enough back to the community. So we started TUG as a way for the technology industry to get involved with local projects. And in particular around education, inner city education, etc. especially when you can leverage technology. Yeah, so, um, so let's get into the technology discussion. What are some of the things you're tracking? What are the big trends you're seeing uh, in big data or in general? So, you know, my partner Chris Lynch has been trying to plant a flag around big data in Boston. And big data is a little bit like cloud six years ago, which is people get lost in the, in the mix between the concept and the actual reality of what big data means. So it's such a buzzword now that it's kind of gone past beyond, beyond the hype curve and people are wondering what can actually be done with big data and is this the next bubble? Well, I work with a, a, a number of companies that actually make, make big data real and it mostly has to do with real time. You know, big data gets really exciting when you have to deal with real time issues. So I have one company in the portfolio called Recorded Future. Recorded Future deals with large government agencies which you know, typically go by the name of Agency A, Agency B, <laughs> Agency C, <laughs> but where you're effectively trying to help operatives behind the lines or people looking after the security of people like ambassadors deal with real-time issues around security. And so what they do is they harness business intelligence at the scale of the web and help you understand location, places, and people, and whether there are security issues that are emerging through social networks in Arabic, uh, through social networks in whatever language you want, and kind of help protect key executives, operating teams on the ground, etc., to make sure that they can carry out their mission, whether it's diplomatic or military, in a way that's safe and secure. So that's the example of Recorded Future as a way of people that are applying big data, um, uh, real-time data analysis on a very large scale to help, in this case, the U.S. government kind of carry out its mission in a good way. So I want to ask you a question about that. So, you know, every year I look back and I say, all right, are we more or less secure than we were last year? And it's like, it seems like the bad guys are just on our tail again. So you're talking about an example where you're actually using analytics to predict as opposed to the way most people really react to events. Do you see this as a means, this approach as a means to sort of keep pace, or can we actually close the gap and become more secure and safer as a society? So I think security in general is an arms race. And if you look at, uh, actually today is a fantastic day to talk about this. So the New York Times led with a fantastic editorial about how they'd been hacked by what they believe to be um, Chinese military hackers that have been hacking into the system for months. And instead of trying to block the attacks, they actually let the attacks happen and then mapped uh, how these people spread across their networks and then called, um, called the first response security companies to help them track what was happening. So, and then the Wall Street Journal followed suit at 4 p.m. today with a similar story of how the Wall Street Journal had been targeted by um, military-related Chinese hackers as to how they were reporting on China, reporting scandals and issues related to leadership. So I think what you're seeing is the, uh, the weaponization of technology, um, including by governments, to target U.S. interests, whether it's corporate or government. And, you know, this is not... There is no absolute response to this. So security is a continuous arms race where you use a number of toolbox and you know big data plays a key part because you actually cannot link an IP address from a Chinese attack back to a Chinese attacker. What you can do is link them to a number of hundreds of computers in American universities that you know by reconciling the data you can tell our in a pattern, uh, are on a pattern basis are related to previous Chinese cyber attacks. And so without big data and without the analysis in real time of lots of log information, you would not be able to derive any conclusions from what's happening to New York Times, Wall Street Journal, or two years ago, the NSA and Google. 
So this is what's so-called advanced persistent threat. You know, it is a national security issue, and it's something that can only be solved by real-time analysis of data. And it is a and it is an arms race because the bad guys have big data too. Um, let's talk about ad tech. Uh, it's it's an area that's obviously gotten a lot of, of money because there is real business value there. You know, some people like Jeff Amabacher have said things, you know, sort of derogatory statements like the best minds of my generation are trying to figure out how to serve up ads, but in the reality, it's a good business. What are you seeing in, in ad tech and do you have any, you know, portfolio companies there and any interest there? So, commenting on Jeff, you know, you can take a societal view and say that America was built on commerce and marketing. And, you know, is that a bad thing? I mean, I don't know. It's just the reality of the U.S. It's what we do. Yeah, it's kind of what you guys do, right? Um, so, in ad tech, I think same thing. The first generation was built on cookie targeting, and it's very blunt. And so what's really interesting now is can I buy advertising in real time, not targeting uh, media, so say CNN.com or your property, but targeting an audience that's moving very fast across the web. So if I have a changing audience and I'm throwing hundreds of variables at you, really the only way to deal with accurate targeting in an online environment in real-time bidding is big data, right? So we have one company that's called DataZoo that helps people, uh, that helps very large advertisers deal with real-time decisioning on their overall advertising spend. And it's actually a derivative of missile guidance systems. How do I track a moving plane through wind and rain so that I can hit the target? Well, there's the same problem as if I throw 400 moving variables at you, how do I make decisioning on individual impressions? So it's a fundamental big data issue, came out of US military, is being applied to US marketing, I suppose. Uh, we have another company called uh, Integral Ad Science. And so Integral Ad Science is trying to deal with when you buy media online, and you're buying a billboard, let's say, is your billboard facing a wall or is it facing the highway? So there's a massive industry in online advertising, but people don't know the quality of what they're buying. Am I buying an ad that's below the fold or above the fold? Is my ad next to porn or is my ad next to appropriate content? Um, is there fraud click happening on my advertising to drive up the CPAs? And so we have a company that is using real-time contextual analysis to help people decide whether they should be buying ad inventory. So think of it as your Procter & Gamble, and instead of blindly spending your ad dollars online, you want an insurance policy that tells you I'm buying it on appropriate sites, it's above the fold, it's being shown not in Brazil between 12 and 2, but in Oklahoma between uh, 8 p.m. and 10 p.m., which is my target. And it's being showed um, in a way that's appropriate to me. In other words, the brands that are adjacent to it kind of fit my, my, um, my position in the market. So again, this is an example of a practical example of take real-time data, take a big data problem, which is contextual analysis, and create an application that helps advertisers do their job better. Yeah, and it seems that, that great description, by the way. It seems like the tech breakthrough there is to be able to take, I'll put in quotes, transactional data and feed a, an analytics database in near real time. Is that right? Is that concept, you know, roughly proximate to what people are doing? So I think that's correct. So if you look at DataZoo, they um, provide decisioning information to the tune of hundreds of thousands of buying decisions per second. And so you're looking at fundamentally, you know, how do I scale this thing um, through NoSQL databases and highly efficient decisioning engines and big data analytics, and at the same time provide a business value that is not reporting, it's not after the fact, I'm helping an advertising make buying decisions in real time. And the real challenge is in a real time world, you know, we all know social media is real time, inference is real time, how do I help the advertisers kind of espouse that world and actually make money of it in a way that is contextual and relevant to the users. And so I think that's a, a shining example of, it didn't used to be called big data, but fundamentally, this is not about algorithms, it's about funneling gazillions of data points into machine learning environments where we're real-time adapting to what the market needs and wants. And so it, this is a, a classic big data example. You know, when I first met you, I interviewed you at Atlas Venture, and uh, you made a statement to me that I, I haven't forgotten. 
I was asking you about East Coast, West Coast, and sort of the difference, and, and, and are you guys going to try to compete with the West Coast? And you said, it's pointless. The West Coast is a vortex, you know, and in a, in a sort of a universe on its own. And we in the East Coast really have to identify our own persona and focused on what we do best. And uh, those words stuck with me. Then, of course, you guys land Chris Lynch. So I got to ask you, first of all, how'd you land a guy like that? How did you convince him to come from an you know, entrepreneur and an angel into this world of VC? It's a, it's a great question. So Chris um, came to us as an EIR in between two gigs. And he was looking at getting into his next play and he was particularly focused on big data. And so we identified together a company called Vertica. And um, Chris was about to give up on Vertica and I remember driving down from New Hampshire with my partner Jeff. And Jeff was on the phone with Chris convincing him to take a deeper look because he said look it's a it's a difficult company it's a damaged company but there's awesome tech there's some great founders there's an asset you can work with and we had no ability to invest in the company and i think chris went back into vertica dug deeper on the back of that call ended up taking the ceo role made a lot of money for himself a lot of money for investors made everybody happy built a real company in the process by the way and then he came back to us and said, look, you didn't try to sell me your stuff. You tried to do the right thing by me. And I think there was a fundamental kind of trust relationship building exercise that happened. Now, that was only step one, because Lynch is a guy who has raised 150 million bucks and returned something like 7 billion. So to land the whale, uh, you know, took a long time. So there's a lot of relationship building and a lot of... Uh, I think he's a, he's a kid from Yonkers, done good, right? Yeah. So this man is somebody who's made you know, a few hundred million dollars, whatever he's worth, and he's a kid from Yonkers. And you know, he doesn't take shit, he doesn't appreciate ego, and at the same time, he still wants to learn. And so you had a, a, a unique mix of skills where you have a loud-mouthed individual who could feature in The Sopranos, mixed with an exceptional executive, mixed with someone who wants to learn. And I think there was, we didn't actually try to sell him, we tried to build relationship and see whether there was mutual fit. And at the end of the day, you know, we took, uh, we took both our foreheads and shook them together and said, we're going to make this happen together, which is typical Chris Lynch uh, kind of activity. And he decided to come on board instead of joining a number of firms that he'd worked with in the past. And you know, Chris is a hand grenade on the table. He's a phenomenal talent. And he's a guy that we love, and I think he's kind of learning what it's like to be t patiently dealing with entrepreneurs instead of running the show. And so he's going through this transition from executive to investor. And as an investor, we're fundamentally spectators of great entrepreneurs. And I think he's doing that transition well. And you know, I, I, I think he's going to be vastly successful, and he's an awesome guy, and we're very grateful to have him here. Well, it certainly makes... Uh your world and our world more interesting. Uh, making money for yourselves, making money for investors, making money for entrepreneurs, and giving back to the community. Fred Destin, thanks so much for taking some time on theCUBE. It's always a pleasure. Thank you, David. It's a pleasure. All right, and thanks for watching, everybody. Uh, we'll be right back after this word.